In the headlines, the manhunt is on. French police say two suspects in the Paris terrorist attack are still on the loose, while a third suspect has turned himself in. Samsung Electronics tips a 37% drop in its fourth quarter operating profit, confirming expectations for its first year of profit decline since 2011. And in the final segment of our 2015 Outlook series, we look into Korea's politics in this new year that's free of election plays. Will President Park's reform drives get a boost? Next. Welcome to the program. You're watching Primetime News live from Seoul. I'm Sean Lim. And I'm Kang Tae-ri. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. We begin with the latest on the horrific terror attack in Paris. A massive manhunt is underway for these gunmen who took 12 lives after storming the offices of a French satirical magazine. For more details, we connect live to Paul Yee at the News Center. Paul, I understand there have been reports that two of the main suspects who fled the scene of the crime have now been spotted. That's right. The two brothers, Renee and Karachi, who authorities say are armed and dangerous, have been seen in the city of Anne in northern France, according to local media. Police are reportedly closing in on the two most wanted men in the country as we speak. The news comes after the youngest of the three main suspects, an 18-year-old identified as Hamid Murad, surrendered earlier to police. France's Prime Minister Emmanuel Valls says several other people in connection with the attack were also detained overnight by authorities. A group of heavily armed men shot dead 12 people on Wednesday, including the editor of the magazine Charlie Hebdo, as well as prominent cartoonists and two police officers. President Francois Hollande denounced the shootings as a terrorist attack and declared Thursday as a national day of mourning. They left their mark on generations and generations of French. Through their influence, through their insolence, through their rare independence. Here, I want to say to them that this message, this message of freedom, will continue to defend it in their name. And uh, there's been uh, reports of another uh, shooting directly at police this time, just a day after this siege in the heart of Paris. Is there any link between these two attacks? Well, there's been no official confirmation yet whether they are connected, and authorities are warning the public and the media not to jump to any rash conclusions. France's top security official, Interior Minister Bernard Savanouve, announced early Thursday that two people, including a female police officer, have been gravely wounded near a metro station south of Paris. However, according to police sources, that officer later died due to her severe injuries. Right, so another tragedy in the city of lights. Paul, this uh, shocking story has been gripping headlines around the world. What's been the reaction from the international community and world leaders? Well, there's been a tremendous outpouring of messages of condolences as well as demonstrations to show support and solidarity with the French, not just in Europe, but across North America and the Middle East. And here in Korea, the government has also voiced its outrage over this assault on the French media. Our government is shocked and furious that many people, including policemen, were sacrificed in the terrorist attack against the satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo in Paris on January 7th. We strongly condemn the act of terrorism. Earlier, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon called the killings a horrendous, unjustifiable and cold-blooded crime. U.S. President Barack Obama, British Prime Minister David Cameron and Chinese President Xi Jinping also condemned the attack, among other world leaders. South Korea's unification minister, Point Man on North Korea, has shown a more flexible stance on government action over the flying of anti-Pyongyang leaflets across the border. The leaflet campaign by civic groups here in the South is a growing issue that's been hindering inter-Korean dialogue. Connie Kim reports. 
South Korea's unification minister says a considerable number of lower-level talks will need to take place before the leaders of South and North Korea can sit down for a summit. Speaking before the National Assembly's Foreign Affairs and Unification Committee on Thursday, Minister Ryu Gyu-jae touched upon a number of inter-Korean-related topics. On top of the possibility of a meeting between President Park Geun-hye and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, Ryu said the lower-level talks would also likely include the possible resumption of reunions for families separated by the Korean War. On the flying of anti-Pyongyang leaflets by South Korean activists across the border into the north, an act that has angered the North Korean regime, Ryu showed eased positions towards the government's stance of having no legal grounds to ban the launches. He added that they would try to prevent the launches if they posed a safety threat to residents in the area. The National Assembly's Foreign Affairs and Unification Committee passed a resolution that urges the government to take action against South Korean civic groups that fly anti-North Korea leaflets across the border. A group of South Korean activists flew 600,000 leaflets across the border on Monday. Now that prompted the North to call on the South Korean government to clearly state its stance on the issue. The prospects of a possible inter-Korean summit were raised at the start of the year when Kim Jong-un said in his New Year's address that Pyongyang was open to talks with Seoul. President Park Geun-hye echoed that sentiment in her New Year's speech, but the leaflet launches have soured the mood. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Senior officials from South Korea and Japan held bilateral economic talks in Seoul on this Thursday. The foreign ministry says the two sides agreed on the need to bolster economic cooperation in their 50th year of normalizing diplomatic ties. Most of the four-hour-long meeting was spent on discussions about Korea's import ban on Japanese fisheries products uh, following the F Fukushima nuclear disaster in 2011. A senior Korean Korean official says Seoul will decide on whether to lift this ban after reviewing the results of private experts inspections scheduled for next week. The official added that the two sides held frank and constructive discussions on all pending issues and said the meeting is a positive sign amid frosty bilateral ties. Samsung Electronics says it will beat market expectations in its fourth quarter, but despite the strong earnings, its operating profit is still expected to drop by the double digits, and that leaves the tech giant with its first annual profit fall in three years. Jim Young Gil has more on how the flagship company ended the year. In a guidance report released on Thursday, Samsung Electronics said its operating profit will likely be 4.7 billion U.S. dollars in the October to December period of 2014, beating expectations. However, that would also mean that profits were down almost 37.5 percent from a year earlier, marking the first annual profit decline since 2011. The main reason for the profit decline was due to shrinking smartphone profits as Samsung's Galaxy line struggles to compete with Apple's iPhone and cheaper Chinese rivals. Increased marketing costs also contributed to the decline in operating profits. But the fourth quarter figure still marks a rebound from the company's third quarter profits of $3.6 billion, which was Samsung's lowest quarterly profit in more than three years. Fourth quarter sales likely fell more than 12 percent on year to some $47 billion, but that's up $4.5 billion from the previous quarter. Analysts presume Samsung's semiconductor division performed better than the cash cow mobile business in the October to December period, aided by a rise in demand for memory chips that go into personal computers and smartphones. Analysts say Samsung's mobile business will better this year. Although the world's smartphone market is still competitive, we expect Samsung to regain its footing with the upcoming release of the Galaxy 6 smartphone. Samsung has also improved its lower-tier smartphone lineups to retain its market share and boost profits. The analyst also predicted that sales of semiconductors and advanced display panels will pick up thanks to the favorable market conditions. Although Samsung did not provide a breakdown of its divisional profits, analysts expect a better picture of Samsung's overall performance once the final earning figures are released later this month. Jim Young-gil, Arirang News. 
In this next report, we take you to this year's International Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. Our Kim ji shows us how the latest and hottest gadgets are getting smarter, more wearable, and super connected. What should I wear? It's a question people constantly ask themselves after setting foot in the 2015 International Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. Perhaps a drone for your wrist that unfolds and takes flight on your command to capture a Kodak moment. Or something that helps you make the most of your time in the gym, tracking your heartbeat and movements. And who needs a chauffeur when you can order your BMW to pick you up right away? BMW, pick me up. It's not science fiction anymore. The age of the Internet of Things has already started. Wearable smart devices are increasingly in the spotlight. Companies present gadgets in line with the Internet of Things, where devices are talking to each other across the Internet. Companies believe that everything we touch or interact with will be connected to the Internet in the next several years. Samsung Electronics set a goal of having all of its devices, including home appliances, connected to the web by 2020. I'm coming home. And the climate for business looks bright with the rising demand for smart home devices. U.S.-based strategy analytics forecasts the global market for smart homes to grow more than $100 billion by 2019. Kim Jeon, Han News. Markets across the world are feeling the effects of the recent drop in oil prices. And despite Korea's finance ministers saying lower oil prices would give the local economy a boost, some are worried about the dragging effects of deflation. Shin Se-min reports. Korea's inflation rate is forecast to fall into the 0% range this year. This is a level not seen since 1999, right after the Asian financial crisis. Credit Suisse, for one, has recently slashed its inflation forecast for Korea from 2.9 percent to 0.9 percent. Among local brokerage firms, Samsung Securities has followed suit. The main culprit, they say, is the spiraling global oil prices. And the real problem could lie in the fact that low prices come coupled with slow consumption and low growth in Korea. We can take these concerns as just warnings for the future. But if government measures like eased monetary policies don't work and we still are faced with a low growth rate and slow production, then we may be in for grave trouble. Recent data points support this view. And last month, growth in consumer prices came in at 0.8 percent, below the 1 percent range for the first time in 15 years. The Korean government is trying to brush off these deflation concerns and fan hopes of economic recovery, saying low oil prices could benefit Korea, boosting domestic demand. But the Bank of Korea is confirming the reality of low inflation. BOK Governor EGR said last month that making adjustments on inflation, reflecting a fall in oil prices, is inevitable. In its last forecast in October, the central bank projected 2.4 percent of consumer price growth for 2015. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Time now for the last installment of our four-part series on Korea's outlook for 2015. Today, we look into the arena of domestic politics. Right, so what's in store for the nation's presidential office, the parliament, and main political parties this year? For more, we're now joined by our Park Ji-won. Hello, Ji-won. Hi, guys. Well, this year will be full of changes and challenges for politicians from both sides. And this year, there will be very noticeable absence, and there's no elections, no national mm. elections this year. So um, Park Geun-hye administration, which is entering the third year out of its five-year term, is hoping to focus entirely on policy goals and reforms that it has envisioned uh, since Inauguration Day about two years ago. But before we get into that, let's first check out the biggest political events of this year. The first major political event of the year will be on February 8th. That's when the main opposition, New Politics Alliance for Democracy, will hold a convention to select a new party leader and Supreme Council members. 
Up until last July, the opposition party was led by two co-leaders, Kim Han-gil and former presidential candidate An chol su However, the party faltered in July's by-elections and has been led by interim leader Moon Hee-sang ever since. Former presidential candidate Moon Jae-in and Park Ji-won, a close aide to former president Kim Dae-jung, will go head-to-head -head for chairmanship of the party in February. On April 29th, by-elections will be held for the three parliamentary seats that turned vacant when the minor opposition Unified Progressive Party was disbanded in December. These are three electoral districts in which traditionally progressive parties have been successful in the past. If the ruling party loses all three this time around, though, it could be seen as a referendum on the incumbent administration. In May, both the ruling and opposition parties will elect their new floor leaders. For the ruling Senate party, an internal strife between supporters of President Park and those who don't stand with her has widened. Whoever replaces current floor leader Lee Wan Gu, who's in the Park Geun-hye camp, will have a big influence on the relationship between the party and the presidential office. Later on in the summer, the minor progressive Justice Party will elect its new leader. So uh, no national elections in 2015, and that's good for us, a little lighter on our workload, but clearly a lot of elections within the party. So how is that expected to sort of shape the political landscape in uh, 2015? Well, experts say the most watched elections of, uh, within the party mm -hmm. will be when the floor leader will be picked in May. Mm -hmm. President Park Geun-hye wants to push through her reform plans and that will require cooperation from the National Assembly. So let's take a listen. The presidential office can push through its agenda at parliament so long as the floor leaders cooperate. For the president, the floor leader is more important than the party leader because the floor leader leads legislative duties. If the ruling party's new floor leader comes from outside President Park's support base, it will be a tough year for the presidential office. So, well, without the elections, uh, without any major elections uh, cluttering her third year in office, we could say that you know, this may be an opportunity for her to really produce some of these uh, tangible results that people are, are waiting for. Uh, what do you think she's going to focus on this year? Well, the government will forge ahead with reform plans aimed at um, a more flexible labor market and uh, improving the state agencies and the national pension system. Mm -hmm. But these are very controversial issues, so it requires a very cautious approach to minimize backlash. And as you can see from the decline in the President Park's approval ratings from nearly 65 percent at one point to below 40 percent at its, at its lowest, the public is paying close attention to what the presidential office is doing and will continue to do so in the new year. And of course, uh, we will uh, continue to keep an eye on this and uh, keep reporting. And I'm sure you will be a big part of it uh, in this uh, new year. Thank you so much, ji for your report. And in other international stories making headlines today, search teams in Indonesia are preparing to raise the tail section of this crashed Air Asia plane from the bottom of the Java Sea. For the latest, we turn again to Paul Yi at the News Center. Paul, despite this breakthrough discovery, it appears they're facing severe challenges in the next stage of this recovery mission. That's right. The tail piece, which was confirmed yesterday to be from Flight 8501, is reportedly buried in mud 30 meters underwater and is believed to be upside down. This as multinational search crews are dealing with stormy weather and high waves. Indonesian officials say they found the crucial wreckage in the secondary search area, which lends ways to theories that strong currents have moved debris and the remains of the many victims who are still unaccounted for. The priority of the day is to lift the tail of the plane because the black box could be in there. Later, the search operation team will brief me what the plan is and the details. Once we're confirmed with the proposed action, we'll start doing it. Finally, the tail is a significant development as it houses the black boxes, which could give investigators clues as to the causes of the crash. 40 bodies have been recovered so far, but authorities believe many of the 122 others who are on the board may still be trapped inside the main body of the plane. 
And taking a look at the financial markets, the Eurozone economy has been hit hard by falling oil prices, with inflation now in negative territory. It marks the first time the currency bloc has officially slumped into deflation in five years. According to year-end estimates released by the European Statistics Office on Wednesday, consumer prices across the Eurozone dropped 0.2% in December from a year earlier. Analysts have mostly attributed the decline to free-falling oil prices. Uh, yes, uh, call rates, inflation rates in the uh, Eurozone might have ticked up slightly, but it's the headline rate of inflation uh, that the person on the street actually cares about and what is going to frame um, consumer behavior going forward. Brent crude has slipped to roughly 50 U.S. dollars a barrel, plunging by more than half since last year's high of $115. Declining oil prices are expected to increase business and consumer spending. But experts say a long period of tumbling prices can choke the economy and prove difficult to get out of. And finally, voting has kicked off in Sri Lanka's presidential election amid heightened security across the country. The incumbent president, Mahinda Rajapaksa, is seeking a third term in office. He's going up against his former health minister, Mathuripala Sirisena, who defected to the opposition camp last year. The incumbent president is surfing a wave of popularity after the 2009 defeat of the Tamil Tiger separatists who waged a 26-year war against the government. Some 15 million people are eligible to cast ballots at polling stations across the country, which opened this Thursday morning. While there have been no reliable opinion polls ahead of the vote, many believe the opposition candidate will benefit from a growing wish for change after a decade under the ruling party. And that wraps up our look at international stories for now. I'll see you back here tomorrow night. Hello and welcome. I'm Stephen Che with a look at sports. Now the AFC Asian Cup is right around the corner. So let's kick things off with a quick preview of the favorites of the tournaments and their key players. First up, Australia. As the home team, the odds are in their favor. And Tim Cahill, at 35 years old, is still their biggest threat at goal. Then there's Japan, the defending champion and winner of three of the last four iterations. Striker Keisuke Honda is the point man, and he has tons of help in the midfield. Now South Korea, meanwhile, is seeking their first win in 55 years, and, they're, and they'll rely heavily on Son Heung-min, a key cog in their attack. Finally, Iran is always in the conversation, but they'll need to dig deep to go all the way. And Ashkan Dejaga is set to be their difference maker on the pitch. Moving on to pro volleyball to the match in Anzan. The OK Savings Bank Russian Cash played host to the LIG Graders. Now the Russian Cash buzz ahead before the Graders even it up at a set apiece. But Simon and Song Myung-gun take the reins for sets three and four, leading the Bees to their 15th win of the season. And heading to the ice, the Korea Figure Skating Championships opened in Seoul, and Koreans, who are still shaking off the post Kim yeon Blues, have reason to be excited. In the ladies' short program, Park so yeon received a score of 60.40 to take the lead, and now has gold in her sights. Park is over 10 points ahead of rival and three-time Nationals winner Kim Hye-jin, heading into the free skate on day two. Along with Che Dabin, who's in second place right now, the rising starlets are ushering in a new generation of figure skaters in Korea. Now to world football. Premier League leader Chelsea really, really want Lionel Messi. Reports say they're willing to buy him out at a monumental 200 million pounds. That's more than 300 million U.S. dollars just for the move. Adding that to the Argentines' contract demands could double the cost. Talks of a rift between Messi and Barcelona management have led to speculation that the 27-year-old is weighing his options. With the transfer window in full swing this January, the move will ultimately come down to the superstar, who so far remains silent on the matter. And that's all I have for now. Your weather's up next. Have a good night.
Hello, and I'm Kim Bo-kyung with your weather forecast. The cold snap that's been gripping the nation is about to break and conditions have eased up compared to yesterday under mostly clear skies. But over on the eastern coast of Gangwon-do province, a dry weather alert has been issued and humidity levels there are down at 25%, so make sure to stay hydrated. On a Friday, temperatures may dip below minus 10 degrees in some areas, but numbers will jump back to the seasonal averages by the afternoon. And some unwelcome news that the fine dust index may rise above average levels in the Chungcheongdo and Gyeongsangdo provinces. Looking ahead, besides the big gap in temperatures from day to night, conditions should be nice for spending time outdoors. On to Friday's readings. Seoul reaches 3, Gwangju 6, Busan hits 8. On to other places. Jeju makes it to 10, Dokdo hits 6, Mount Kumgang remains colder. That'll do it for now, but more updates coming up after midnight. See you then. Thank you very much, Po Gyeong, and that's primetime news for this uh, Thursday. I am Kang Chidi. Thanks for watching. And I'm Sean Lim. We'll see you again the same time tomorrow night. Good night.